All we've got to do now is to start pumping. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. I am your host, Marcus Whitman. And this week, we have a little bit of a change of pace show. I haven't had time this week to get through every single game. Got back from Chicago later last night. So yeah, I haven't had time to get through every game, like I said, and not going to be able to give a full weekly recap this week. And we got to get started on studs and duds due out to you guys on Friday. So instead, going to be A little bit of a shorter show here today, but a show that I think you guys are going to be really fired up for. I certainly am. We are going to be ranking every front office in the NFL by tiers here. It's something uh, you guys have been requesting for a while. I think this is a really good time to do it as we are starting to think about the offseason for about half of these teams. And we had a big news drop of the firing of the Titans general manager, John Robinson. So I think a timely time to do this. And uh, then we'll get into the mailbag. I, I also am going to talk a little bit about that big news drop for the Titans and a little bit about the Baker Mayfield edition for the Rams. So going to be a good show here. Really looking forward to it. Before we do get started, though, I want to let you guys know this show is made possible by my amazing supporters on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash that franchise guy, where over there you can, of course, support my show financially, but you will also be able to become a part of it. We're going to be getting into that mailbag here at the end of the show. All of these questions are submitted through the DMs on Patreon from my amazing supporters. Just $1 a month, you can get access to submit questions to the show. Uh, Additionally, you can get bonus content. Going to be working up on some film rooms here as soon as possible. Going to be hoping to do Geno Smith, Justin Fields, maybe Tua here in the month of December. So uh, some NFL film rooms there and my weekly NFL picks where we just had a 4-0 week there. Um, picking games. So uh, all of that available on Patreon. And additionally, (laughs) thanks for hearing me out. I got to tell you guys about my friends at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy now sponsoring the show. You guys have seen the screenshots, these weekly pick'em contests of anywhere from two to five player props that you are parlaying together with massive payouts up to 20 to 1. You get to pick which players you think perform well, which players you think don't perform well. It increases your interest in any given NFL matchup. And again, the payoffs are huge. I have loved playing on Underdog Fantasy, uh, their pick'em contests. Uh, it's the best in the biz right now. It's gotten me back into daily fantasy. So right now, you can sign up at Underdog Fantasy and use promo code TFG at sign up, and they will match up to $100 on your first deposit. That's like a year's worth of playing these pick em contests right there because you only have to do anywhere from two to five dollars per entry. So that's underdog fantasy promo code TFG. And let's get into the let's get into the football talk. So let's start with the Brown, uh, sorry, the Rams. I, I still think Baker Mayfield's a Brown in somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, but now the Rams picking up Baker Mayfield off of waivers after requesting his release from the the Carolina Panthers. You know that that part wasn't too much of a surprise. The Baker Mayfield story had written itself in Carolina. Uh, but for the Rams, this is an interesting pickup for a variety of reasons. Uh, first and foremost is. You know, I think a lot of people expected the Niners to maybe claim them. And uh, I may have heard that they didn't even put a claim in for him, which is fascinating, shows that they believe in Brock Purdy. But uh, the Rams kind of blocking the Niners from potentially getting a quarterback the week after Jimmy Garoppolo got hurt. Um, But this is also fascinating for the Rams because Matthew Stafford is dealing with this, honestly, I would just say suspicious injury. It's kept him out, I think, already longer than a lot of people expected. There were discussions coming into the year that perhaps his shoulder was bothering him. Matthew Stafford getting up there in age now. I think he's, what, 36 now? Let me just pull this up. Uh, Okay, he's only 34. Will be 35 come next season. February birthday there. So... You know, I I think they feel probably pretty good about Stafford returning, and and I'm not trying to write any doom and gloom stories here, but, you know, Baker Mayfield, 
is a player with a lot of theoretical upside. Uh, number one overall pick, really strong arm, mobile enough. Someone that they could potentially see, you know, get some reps in here and see how he looks as maybe a long-term answer. And that's really all it comes down to for the Rams. It's a no-risk, high-reward claim. They were atop the waiver order. I think they had the third spot. Uh, you knew the ja- uh Sorry, I guess the Texans could have done it, but, you know, it... it there's not a lot of teams lining up to bring in Baker Mayfield, who has kind of expectations to be in a conversation for a starting job, uh, given his resume. And not a lot of teams are looking for starting quarterbacks right now. You know, the Rams and the Niners might be the end of that list. Um, but anyway, for the Rams, it makes a ton of sense. You can sit Stafford for the rest of the year, let him get fully healthy. And Baker can step in in a system that he's relatively familiar with. He played this system in Cleveland under Kevin Stefanski. Very similar terminology, lingo, all that. Uh, He can step in maybe as early as Thursday, I saw, uh, and be their starter for the rest of the the year. And he's a better option than they had in Bryce Perkins and and, uh, Clive Walford. And then you can see, okay, does he have a career rejuvenation with better coaching, a better system in place for his skill set? And then you go from there. It's it's really not any more complicated than that. If he plays well, I would say there's a pretty good chance he's back with the Rams on like a, you know, a Teddy Bridgewater, um, Marcus Mariota style contract. I'm talking about Raiders Marcus Mariota where it's, you know, one, two years, anywhere from three to four mil a year, and it's like a career rejuvenation project where he would be behind Stafford, learning the system, getting familiar with the team, and being a good backup for a quarterback now that might have durability concerns. So it is a good fit as far as everything I've said about what Baker Mayfield is as a quarterback right now and kind of what his next step in in his career would be. Looking at the Rams, it, it makes about as much sense as anyone, given given the coaching, given the quarterback in front of him with his age and durability concerns and the system. So uh, I like the move for the Rams. It'll be fun to see him uh, playing for the Rams, even though you know that I, I don't really expect a whole lot. He, he looked pretty broken in Carolina. Uh, looks like that final year in Cleveland developed a lot of bad tendencies for him uh, and, and hurt his confidence to push the ball downfield quite a bit. So we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, And then we also got to talk about the Tennessee Titans firing their general manager, John Robinson, really out of nowhere in the middle of the season, a year where the Titans are in prime position to win their division. It's, It's basically locked at this point that they're a playoff team. And, you know, the organization had kind of treated this as a, a transition season in a lot of ways. They didn't, bring in this influx of of free agency and and get aggressive to build this roster. They actually went the other way around. They traded away their star receiver for a first round pick. They drafted a young quarterback in the third round. And to me, that is what this is all about is not that John Robinson is a bad GM, more so that there was a big disagreement between Mike Vrabel and, and the GM. Because we know that when they traded A.J. Brown, Mike Vrabel was pissed. There's video evidence of it. And to me, that was kind of a, a fork in the road with that was eventually going to lead to this. Because Vrabel is an amazing NFL head coach. But he is a very, I don't want to say loud personality, but... And I don't want to say is a big ego, but I think you guys know what I mean. Like he knows what he wants and he's going to get what he wants. So when someone else who has power within the organization maybe takes the organization in a completely different path than he wanted to go, it was going to lead to some confrontation. And to me, this was not firing John Robinson because he was a bad general manager. It was the organization choosing Mike Vrabel over John Robinson in what I think was most likely a very heated discussion or several following the really destruction of Mike Vrabel's own defense by A.J. Brown himself this last week against the Philadelphia Eagles. So to me, this was the team choosing Mike Vrabel over John Robinson, which is an easy decision. 
It really is. Mike Vrabel is an incredible head coach, and he's in the top five head coach conversation. And he's kind of sticking it to John Robinson in a lot of ways because they are still in the playoff picture. They are still a very good football team, despite the fact that you know John Robinson didn't do a whole lot to help this year's Tennessee Titans. And if you're the organization looking at this, it's not like John Robinson is some incredible GM. I think he's a good GM. I think they've done a good job finding value, whether that's later in the draft with guys like Christian Fulton and A.J. Brown, of course, uh, Harold Landry, Chigo Conquo this year. I think the Malik Willis pick had a lot of value. Uh, they find value in free agency with guys like uh, Cunningham, the, the the linebacker from, from Houston, even though that was a Vrabel guy in, in Houston, so there was some familiarity there. But a guy like Tyre Tart and um, you know, uh, um, Amani Hooker was a great value find. Like they do a really good job finding pieces for their team, but they have really struck out in the first round quite horribly. They draft the Georgia offensive lineman who played like six snaps for them before retiring for his rap career, Isaiah Wilson. The risk on, uh, um, I always struggle with his name because he's barely played, but the Virginia Tech corner. They draft in the first round two years ago. He hasn't been able to stay healthy, and when he's been on the field, he's been bad. Uh, and then this year, you know, it, it, Traylon Burks looks like he's going to be a player for him. I'm not going to say that was a miss, but to trade A.J. Brown for him, I think we all agree, was um, a, a lack of foresight for the market. I mean, A.J. Brown is worth a lot more than the 18th overall pick, uh, and that's all they got for him. So, you know, they, they have struck out there, but... This was, to me, more about a disagreement between Mike Vrabel, who knows what he wants and is going to get what he wants. And uh, I hope the best for John Robinson. I I think someone would be smart to bring him in as uh, an assistant scout and make him a part of your staff. It'll probably be someone like the Rams or the Eagles, a really smart, forward-thinking organization, maybe the Bills, uh, who brings a guy like that in to help their staff. And maybe he gets another crack somewhere. I, I don't know. Uh, I think he's only like 50, so pretty young for for GM's sake. Now, that is a great transition to our main topic for the show. We are going to be doing one of these tier maker lists of every single front office in the NFL. We're going to be ranking these guys by five tiers, these teams really, by five tiers, because there's different power structures. There's GMs that get the full say. There's some coach-GM relationships. There's a few team, There's a few teams where the coach has most of the, the, the saying power at all. So we're really just ranking the teams, not necessarily the GMs themselves. Uh, but our five tiers here are going to be starting at the bottom, needs to be fired tier. Then we have the hot seat tier. Then we have the fine tier, like they're just adequate. Then we have a good tier, and then an elite tier. So pretty straightforward there, pretty self-explanatory. Let's get started. And with the needs-to-be-fired tier, I really only have one team, actually, uh, here at the bottom, and that's the Arizona Cardinals. I think this has reached its finale here, even though they just extended both coach and GM, the GM Steve Keim and uh, Cliff Kingsbury after they made the playoffs last year. But Steve Keim to me is is really in a tier of his own, obviously, as far as being the worst GM in the league. You look at what he did back in 2015, and, and he was doing a great job. I mean, he had the Cardinals built like a Super Bowl contending roster. A ton of great moves, drafting Tyron Matthew, bringing in Carson Palmer, uh, a lot of great stuff there with that that good era with with Bruce Arians and all those guys. But really, since that era ended, since Arians left and uh, since uh, Carson retired, it's fallen apart, really down to the bare bones. And it, it started with the drafting of Josh Rosen, and that didn't work out. That was really a wasted draft class. And then... They do make the move. I, that's maybe the one thing saving Steve Kimes' job to this point is going to get Kyler Murray and and you know writing off Josh Rosen as a sunk cost. I think that was a good call. But, man, they have had draft mistake after draft mistake, none larger than drafting Andy Isabella over DK Metcalf. They have done a horrible job really just replenishing the 
the the meat and bones of the roster, really like the trenches among any NFL team. I don't think any any team has has placed less of a value on offensive and defensive linemen, and you can just feel it when you watch the Cardinals play. They don't get pushed at the line of scrimmage. They don't have great pass protection. Uh, they don't get after the quarterback up front. And when they have gotten after the quarterback, it's been old veterans, Chandler Jones, Marcus Golden, and 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 uh, J.J. Watt. You know, really the only hit they have is just now showing up Zach Allen in his third or fourth year, who was a third-round pick. So that's been where they've really faltered uh, this year, just doubling down on that, tripling down on that. They trade a first-round pick for Marquise Brown, who's a fine player. I don't hate Marquise Brown, but in the context of what the Cardinals needed, I do. You know, pass rush, O-line, cornerback, plenty of better options to go with than trading a first-round pick for Marquise Brown, who you're now going to have to pay. Then they take Trey McBride in the second round, who was not a need at the time. They're not using him now, even if Zach Ertz is hurt. I didn't like the scheme fit in their spread offense. So that was bad. And then they even, you know, on a much smaller scale, they trade another draft pick for Robbie Anderson. Why? You, you have Rondale Moore. Find a way to get him going. It just... That is where this this organization has really gone wrong, let alone the fact he's had, uh, Steve Kime has had off-field issues. 2018, he pled guilty to extreme DUI. He had a 20% alcohol BAC behind the wheel. Uh, no respect for that. So uh, he, to me, is in a tier of his own worst front office in the NFL, the Arizona Cardinals, and, and put Cliff Kingsbury on top of that because I do think his mentality for this organization is that Big 12 mindset, spread offense, speed, speed, speed. Uh, that doesn't work in the NFL. You need to have a balance of speed and physicality, and the Cardinals do not have that. Uh, and we didn't even get into really how bad their drafts have been because they've been uh, pretty catastrophic <laughs> over the last three or four years. That speaks for itself. All right. Then we have our next tier, and this is our, our, our GM's on the hot seat tier. And I have six teams in this tier. And the first two I want to talk about, um, well, well, the, the first team I want to talk about is the Jacksonville Jaguars with, with Trent Baalke. And Jags fans will be happy to know, you know, I still don't really believe in Trent Baalke. There was a social media really trend to trying to get this guy fired before the draft. And uh, I think that still is pretty justified. I mean, he hasn't just looking at this most recent off season, it hasn't been a complete train wreck, but you got to remember the Jags had the number one pick, which means they had the 33rd overall pick as well. They had a, a complete ass load of free agent money. They had really the entire pool of resources to make this team the best version of themselves this year and th they didn't quite hit everything on the head now the reason he's not in the needs to be fired tier is he's done some nice stuff I do believe that I think their free agency class was actually pretty dang good um, I think in a year where there weren't really outside of you know, trading for an Amari Cooper or trading for an A.J. Brown, which is certainly something this team could have explored, um, but they did have the number one pick, uh, so A.J. Brown might have been difficult to acquire there because um, you're not trading the number one pick for A.J. Brown, or, I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather do that than draft Trayvon Walker, which is a different conversation, but logically speaking, you're not doing that. Anyway, they had a decent free agency class. I think Zay Jones was a good value signing. They liked what they saw there. He's come in and been a good starting wide receiver for them. Uh, unfortunate timing coming off his worst game for the Jags. I think he had three drops against Detroit, but that has not been his M.O. this season. You know, Christian Kirk, they got a lot of flack for that. Yes, they overpaid for him, but they had to. Like I said, there was a big market for him in a year where there weren't a lot of free agent receivers available, and they had to overpay to get him. They have plenty of cap space to do it, and he has even returned something close to what they are asking him to be. And he's been a dominant slot receiver for them. He's been a piece that they've needed. I can't. I would hate to see what this offense would look like without Christian Kirk. Uh, Evan Ingram has had some ups and downs this year. He's been okay for a kind of value signing. Uh, they've done a good job with the offensive line. You know, um, 
the bringing in Brandon Sheriff, and, and they've been pretty good there. So they have been far from terrible uh, as far as what their offseason was in free agency, but you look at their draft, and the the drafting of Trayvon Walker, I think it's finally time to, to revisit that because I was obviously very critical of that draft selection. I thought Aiden Hutchinson would have been a p- better pick. I went out on a limb and said Garrett Wilson would have been a better pick. I think any of the offensive tackles would have been a better pick. I just... I don't think Trayvon Walker was a good enough prospect to go that high in the draft. I thought he was a first round guy. He's got upside, a lot of physical abilities, but we're seeing, you know, he is not ready to play. He did not rush the passer at Georgia, and he's kind of been an afterthought this season. He's had a couple highlights. They were mostly earlier on in the year. And you look at Kayvon Thibodeau dominating, Aiden Hutchinson's having a great year. All those guys I said they should have taken instead would have been better picks at this point. So that's definitely frustrating, uh, especially for a guy that was known for kind of overvaluing defensive linemen and physical traits at that position. Uh, Honestly, it's time to revisit the Devin Lloyd uh, evaluation. After the first month of the year, we jumped on board. I jumped on board. Uh, I'm obviously not a fan of Quay Walker, uh, but at this point, I think you would take Quay Walker over Devin Lloyd, which that turned very quickly. Devin Lloyd's been benched in Jacksonville, you guys. We haven't really talked about that. They're going to Chad Muma and Foye Aluakun. He went about six straight weeks, Devin Lloyd did, of getting absolutely abused in coverage. And right now, that's looking like a bad pick. And this is really why I say don't draft linebackers in the first round. Um, you know, they what did they do in the second round? They took, um, what, was the, what was the Jags second round pick? Why can't I, I remember this? Did they trade down and then end up with Muma and um, – I think they traded down and got Muma and – yeah, they must have. They got Luke Fortner, who's been fine at center, Chad Muma at linebacker. You know, f- considering they had the first pick in every round, not great uh, from Trent Baalke. So we're, we're really going down this path of a guy that I think we all know is not a great GM, uh, but I would say – uh, Trent Baalke, absolutely on the hot seat. He's probably going to get one more year at this. Uh, Jags fans probably not too happy about this. But if they went ahead and fired him, would not be overly surprised as well. Uh, yeah, he's just not doing a great job. And then another couple of teams on the hot seat here that might be a little more controversial because they're rather new. GMs usually get more than two years. Uh, but for both these guys, they are now going to be heading into their third year. And I think they should be on the hot seat. Uh, Whether the organization sees it that way, that's to be determined. But the Atlanta Falcons, Terry Fontenot, I'm putting him on the hot seat here. I really am. I have not been blown away with what he's done, and it's really those big draft decisions at the top. And what else? There's nothing more important for a new GM, a first-time young GM, than what do you do with top 10 picks during a rebuild? Now, I like that they traded away Julio Jones. They traded away Matt Ryan. That's a good thing they've done to get rid of veterans that are clearly declining to get good picks for those guys. But what they've done with now two top eight picks is is pretty bad. So they had the fourth overall pick, and they take Kyle Pitts. Now, Kyle Pitts is super talented. But unfortunately, the vision was not there with their head coach. They do not know how to use Kyle Pitts. They should have taken, if they wanted offense— Jamar Chase, or maybe have the vision to take a Micah Parsons, who's now the best defensive player in the year, uh, defensive player in the league. Or maybe find your quarterback. Justin Fields was there with the fourth overall pick. Instead, they take a tight end, Kyle Pitts, who just has not worked out there. And then you fast forward to his second draft, 2022, and they take Drake London with the eighth overall pick. And I was critical of this pick. Drake London is not a bad player. Kyle Pitts is certainly not a bad player. But when you are drafting that high, the conversation changes. And Drake London, to me, was someone that belonged closer to that 16 to 25 range in the draft of a good first-round prospect. Um, I had a first to a second-round grade on him, which puts him in that 20 to, to 45 range. And they passed on some real serious talent at this wide receiver class. They, most notably, Garrett Wilson, which was the name I really hit on, is this was wide receiver one. To take Drake London over that player is really confusing to me, and Garrett Wilson looks incredible. 
Um, but I also had, um, you know, Jameson Williams ahead of him. We, we have yet to see what, what Jameson Williams can do. I had Traylon Burks ahead of him, who looks really explosive. And in, in the last three weeks of him being healthy, I think he's shown a little more juice than Drake London. Uh, I did have Jahan Dotson over him, where that, you know, the really I think w- what we're seeing is, is Taylor Heineke just wants to throw to Terry McLaurin. But uh, Jahan Dotson looks talented. If nothing else, I think Dotson and Drake London both like look like, you know, similar caliber players. And, yeah, I just, I did not like the the Drake London pick, and I, I hate to dog on this too much, but the, the expectations change when you have the opportunity to get a superstar with the eighth overall pick. I think they got a stud. They did not get a star, as they could have very easily by picking a different player at that position, most notably Garrett Wilson. And then the Desmond Ritter situation is getting more confusing. I think what we are seeing is a lack of um, communication between the GM and the foresight of the team with Arthur Smith because we saw it with Pitts. Um, I think that what, the other thing with drafting Drake London is I said his skill set was redundant with Kyle Pitts, and it absolutely has been. Uh, yeah, London's producing, but it, I think, has come at the cost of of – Kyle Pitts, who dominates in the same areas of the field that Drake London does. So I think there was a lack of foresight there. And then with the selection of Desmond Ritter, I thought it was a good value, but I criticized the pick. I gave it a C, not because I didn't like where he was taken and, and that it wasn't a value. It was because I didn't understand the the upside of, of the selection because they had brought in Marcus Mariota. You knew he was going to be the day one starter. You knew this team was not going to be particularly good. And Desmond Ritter is not a high upside prospect. I said, if you're going to take a quarterback there, why not Corral? Why not Malik Willis? Why not even uh, Sam Howell, who have strong arms? Desmond Ritter, to me, just is... My, my pro count for him was Marcus Mariota. And the fact that he's not starting at this point, it's just... It's all very confusing for me with Atlanta. And I don't really love anything they've done. They've had some decent picks. I like Arnold Ebicady. I like Troy Anderson. Uh, but, man, it just has not... They haven't done a good enough job of... You know, they're heading into year three now together with Terry Fontenot and um, and Arthur Smith. And, like, compare it to where Detroit's going to be next year. Detroit really feels like they're building on stuff. They're hitting on draft picks. Every move they make builds upon itself and is building what feels like is going to be something really special. Atlanta just feels like they're kind of staying in neutral. And I think some of these draft decisions have been a big part of that. So I'm putting Terry Fonten onto the Atlanta Falcons on the hot seat. Um, then we have Carolina, Scott Fitterer. This one's much more straightforward. This thing has just fallen apart. And I think you know, he, he's made some decent draft picks. Ikem Aquanu is a great pick, but their drafts have been very up and down. They haven't nailed free agency, really. I just don't think he's done a great job. I, I don't think that's controversial to say. And now, as they look for a new head coach, are they looking for a new GM already after two years of Scott Fitterer? That one's much more straightforward, I think. Um, then and, and missing on those quarterbacks is a big part of that as well. Uh, then we have Green Bay, and I, honestly, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we've been ranting about Brian Gutekunst like all year long, um, but Brian Gutekunst has to be on the hot seat. Now, he's not going to be fired next year, uh, probably not going to be fired the year after that, because the reality with Brian Gutekunst is his highs are extremely high, but his lows are so low. He might be the most polarizing GM in the league, and he has certainly bought himself more time with Christian Watson hitting, and you've got to give him credit for that. I mean, if we did this a month ago, I would have put him in the needs-to-be-fired category. But this was an impressive draft pick. They traded two second-round picks, which was a lot. Um, I liked Christian Watson, I but on draft night I said, just you should have just taken him in the first and saved those two second-round picks and not taken Quay Walker. I think I was right about that. But they at least went and got Christian Watson. And this guy's been a complete game changer for the Green Bay Packers. So that has bought them time. It looks like uh, Romeo Dobbs is going to get to get back out there healthy soon. And he showed flashes early on. They hit Zach Tom in the draft this year. Uh, they've brought in a, a couple of free agents that have helped now in in Rudy Ford stepping in at, at safety. Now, he's been a nice addition because he's replaced 
who's now a bust in Darnell Savage, who was one of Gutekunst's formerly first-round drafted defensive players. So there's these, there are these highs, right? The, the signings of Rasul Douglas and Devondre Campbell last year. He does some stuff that has kept this Packers team really um, roster-wise in a pretty good place. But there are specific lows that he has that are extremely frustrating, and, and most of which, of course, is his, um, his lack of foresight for the team. And he, he had a quote to, uh, two days ago that just had me shaking my head. Someone asked him, like, something, something about, can you imagine if this team had Devon, Devontae Adams and Christian Watson? And you would not fucking believe his answer. He said... Well, if we still had Devontae, we probably don't have those guys because it changes your needs and the projection for the team. That's all you need to know about Brian Gutekunst. Yet, when when push came to shove and he absolutely had two draft-wide receivers, he seems to have done a good job finding them. But he basically said he wouldn't have drafted a wide receiver if they still had Devontae Adams. So this year it would have been Devontae Adams, Alan Lazard, and Randall Cobb. It's just unbelievable that he hates that position group so much. Uh, so that's that's a huge concern moving forward. I, I also think in general, they're not aggressive in free agency and they're not um, aggressive in the trade market. They are still that traditional draft and develop old school mentality. And honestly, I think that transcends Brian Gutekunst, right? I, and I've talked about that where this is an organiz- this, this team has organizational dysfunction because they think they can build a team like it's 1990 where you draft and develop, but you've got teams every year going for gold, and they're just going to out-aggressive you and and build a better roster than you can just through the draft. You have to explore those other avenues. So this is one of those situations where it's not just Brian Gutekunst, who I do genuinely think is a pretty good scout, but the organizational philosophy and the team-building strategy from both Gutekunst and just the organization at large is on the hot seat because it just has not been able to build a championship team in Green Bay. The other um, GM on the hot seat is is Chris Ballard for the Indianapolis Colts, who has, like Gutekunst, done some really good stuff. He's had some really good hits in the draft. I think it was 2018. They they draft – let me just pull it up here. I have the link – uh, I don't have the save, but uh, the link save. But you know, 2018, I think they brought in Quentin Nelson, Braden Smith, and Darius Leonard all in the same draft class. I mean, that's a that's a crazy good draft. That's one of the best drafts any teams had in in recent memory. Um, just nailing stars at, at the top, but they have really struggled to hit on the most critical positions of the team. Obviously, quarterback. Uh, tackle other than Braden Smith. They haven't been able to fix that left tackle situation since Anthony Costanzo retired. Uh, Edge rush, they've found some pieces, but they haven't been able to to nail a superstar there. Uh, You know, Quidi Pei's a good player. Yannick Ngakwe is a good player. Neither of them are superstars. Cornerback, they've really struggled there. They had to sign Stefan Gilmore to patch that position. Um. You know, the, the the position groups that really change games, that's been an issue for Chris Ballard. The wide receiver, they've hit guys, but they haven't hit superstars. You know, Michael Pittman's a good player. He's not a great player. Uh, Alec Pierce, w- we'll see. But that's when you can go from a good team to a great Super Bowl contending team. And Ballard over the last three years has really struggled to do that. So that's, that's an indictment on him. And they've just straight up been too conservative. They... Don't move up in drafts to go and get a player like that. They don't make big free agent signings. You know, Stefan Gilmore was the biggest thing they did, and he was far from a A list free agent. So, and, and you know, they go and trade for Yannick Ngakwe. That's fine, but they gave up on Rocky Sin, who was one of those corners that they missed on. So, I just think with them moving to a different coach. It's something for Indianapolis to think about, and I know Ballard. Um, I, I know I know Ursay really defended Chris Ballard, but I lost a lot of. Res- I've been losing respect for Chris Ballard through the last few years. I think Colts fans have felt that that have followed my analysis. I'm just kind of growing tired of of him being 
a little conservative and and not hitting on those critical positions. But now he comes out and he's like attacking the media in that press conference. And he was like, well, you guys have been dogging on me for to take receivers for years. And now our offensive line sucks. It's like, come on, dude. That's not how this works. You you chose you, you drafted the the left tackle out of Central Michigan who who didn't work out. You you traded your first round pick away. Like <laughs> you you could have gone and and made a big aggressive move to go get uh, an offensive lineman. But I, I don't know. Just maybe I'm not doing a good job explaining that. But to act like it's the media's fault. Well, well, the other thing that bothered me about that is, yeah, you did need wide receivers. The media was right, but you also need offensive linemen. You got to do your job there. So, I don't know. It was just kind of a, uh, a, a what, what's the word I'm looking for? Just um, brain dead or or tone deaf. It was just kind of a tone deaf response. Like you're the GM of the football team. You're not, you're, you're you're more you're responsible for more than one position, right? So. Chris Ballard to me on the hot seat as they look for a new coach next year. Uh, and then the Chargers as well. And uh, I think it's time to put, um, unfortunately, uh, Tom Telesco on, on the hot seat. I, I like Telesco a lot. I think he does a great job finding high end talent. Justin Herbert, of course, I think bought him a lot of time. He, he, you know, I like Zion Johnson. I love Derwin James. Like they, they typically draft really well in the first round, but even then last couple years, Jerry Tillery was not a good pick. I, I probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have been my pick for them. Um, oh, by the way, you know, second round has been good for them as well. Sante Samuel, a uh, good example there, but you know, they trade up for a linebacker in Kenneth Walker. How many times do I have to say, don't draft linebacker in the first round, unless you're getting a Micah Parsons or a Roquan level prospect. Um, you know, Kenneth, Kenneth Murray, did I say Kenneth Walker? Kenneth Murray was not that. So that, but but their their mid rounds are horrible for the Chargers. This one I do have the link for, I think. Like, let me just read off the last three years. Let's go rounds three on. So 2020. Josh Kelly, no longer with the team, or he is still with the team, but he's he's backup running back. Joe Reed, no longer with the team. Aloe Gilman and K.J. Hill. So they got nothing. They took Justin Herbert and then got nothing because they traded up for Kenneth Murray. Those picks disappeared because they traded up for Kenneth Murray. So they didn't pick until the fourth round there. No second, no third round pick. Okay, 2021. Third round, okay, they did draft Josh Palmer. He looks like a decent player. Um, I guess we'll see if he can increase his upside. He's He's been a fine player, not the end of the world, but he's not been a game-changing receiver for them in a really deep receiver class. Uh, they took Trey McKitty, Chris Rumpf, uh, Brendan Hamis, Nick Neiman, Larry Roundtree, Mark Webb, nothing there. Round three on uh, from Josh Palmer. Uh, okay, and then 2022, I know it's early, but... They took JT Woods, who has not been an impact at safety, really raw player. He could still work out. That was third round. Then they took Isaiah Spiller in the fourth round. You would expect him to be an impact running back. He has not been. Uh, Otito Ogbanya, okay. Now they, okay, they did hit Jamari Sawyer in the sixth round. That's like the best day three pick they've had uh, in a long time. Um, Jasir Taylor, Dean Leonard, and a fullback. Uh, but you, you can even go before that, right? You can go to 2019. Trey Pipkins, Drew Tranquils, decent linebacker, Easton Stick, Amike Egbuile, Cortez Broughton. Really nothing. Uh, 2018. Justin Jones, Kaiser White did some decent stuff there, actually. But, you know, you get the point. You can't just hit first, second round and find one impact on day three in three drafts, which is really what it is. Just want to double. Yeah, I mean, Jamari Sawyer was a great pick in the sixth round. But out of three drafts, that's all you're getting. Um, and a high third-round pick in Josh Palmer, that's just that's just not going to cut it. And they haven't, you know, they they got aggressive in free agency. They went, they went for J.C. Jackson, Khalil Mack. Unfortunately, J.C. Jackson got hurt. Um, but even when he was out there, that that was not looking like a great move. So 
they they should be further along than they are, and I think it's the lack of depth and young players coming through the woodworks for them that has really hurt the Chargers. So I think Tom Telesco has the capability to turn this thing around. I wouldn't fire him right away, but it's got to be a great offseason. It's got to be a great draft for Tom Telesco coming up. So those are our hot seat GMs. Uh, then we have a our next tier is going to go much quicker because there's not as much to say about this next group. This is our fine or adequate tier. These are GMs that just we don't most of them are guys we don't know enough about or there are some GMs that have had some really big highs and some really big lows. So, uh, you know, we'll kind of rip through this. Chicago, Ryan Poles comes in this tier. They've done a good job kind of cleaning house, identifying that this team was not ready. I like that as an organizational philosophy. That's easy to do. Now, they go and get Chase Claypool for what's going to be, at this point, basically a first-round pick. You know, I... I would have traded a second round pick for Chase Claypool if I thought he was a missing piece, like if I was Green Bay, for example. Um, but at this point, you know, the passing game wasn't really ready to plug him in, and he's going to be coming up on the last year of his contract. I still think there's room for that to work out. I think Claypool's a really talented player, uh, but that is a large draft pick to give up from a bad team. Definitely something to keep an eye on there. So Ryan Poles, very young has a lot of time to, to figure this thing out and a lot of draft picks and a lot of free agency. We're, we're going to learn uh, which direction he's going to go, whether that's up or down. Then we have Houston. You know, a lot of negativity around Houston, but for what it's worth, I think Nick Casario has done a relatively solid job trying to make chicken salad with chicken shit. I mean, seriously, they they have nothing to work with. And I think retaining Laramie Tunsil was good for this team. I think Retaining Brandon Cooks was good for this team. Even if he's upset, that's something that you're going to be really happy you have Laramie Tunsil and Brandon Cooks when you're sitting there looking at potentially drafting Bryce Young, right? That can turn around in a hurry for the for a guy like Brandon Cooks if he gets a quarterback that can come in. Uh, John Mechie, unfortunately, developed cancer, but he should be back. He, hopefully he can get healthy. Um, you know, I, I just think we're still learning about Nick Casario, but I certainly wouldn't put him on the hot seat or say he's done a bad job with what he's had to work with. And it's not like a lot of good free agents are lining up to go sign in Houston right now either. Uh, the Raiders, Dave Ziegler takes over in 2022. They decide to get aggressive and not a whole lot to really evaluate there. I, I did not like the Chandler Jones acquisition. Devonte Adams looks freaking incredible though. So um, hard to be too critical of Dave Ziegler. They also did a good job, I think, draft with the picks they did add. You know, you know, Parham is a good player. They found him in third round. Uh, so Dave Ziegler, I, I think, is definitely better than Gruden right now. Uh, then we got Minnesota Quesi Adefo. Oh, oh, sorry, Quesi uh, Odafo Mensa. I, I think he's done a fine job. It's been one year. The draft to me is is looked. It, it's just. Um, TBD, really. I wasn't a huge fan of their draft class. Um, it was one of my least favorites, actually. Um, but, you know, Lewis seen plenty of time to prove me wrong. He gets hurt. Um, but that clearly was not the impact that, you know, I was at least right that he's he's not an impact player. He, he was not able to win a starting job out the gate. You expect a, a first-round safety to be able to do that. Um, but I, I just didn't like his coverage instincts coming out of Georgia. They didn't really ask him to do anything but run and chase. He's, he's got a lot of athletic ability and can still turn around. Um, but in the second round, I thought they overdrafted Ed Ingram. He has not looked good. Um, they're not getting anything from the linebacker. I, I didn't love their draft, but free agency, they get Zadarius Smith. That basically saves their entire offseason. I mean, that was incredible. Um, they they signed the the D tackle from Buffalo. He's been good. Like they've they've done a decent enough job here for Minnesota, but nothing, nothing great from Quessy yet. Then we have Tennessee, obviously, to be determined with a new GM, soon to be hired, but I expect that's going to be pretty fine with Mike Vrabel probably calling the shots there. Uh, then Miami is actually going to be in this tier, and that sounds weird because they had such a great offseason, right? Uh, they go get Teron Armstead. They trade for Tyreek Hill. That has completely changed their season. Uh, the Tua pick looking good now all of a sudden. And that's all good and fine. Um, it's one good offseason of... You know, a year three quarterback developing in large part thanks to your coach um, and signing some 
some veterans that you know are already good. Their drafting, to me, still leaves a lot to be desired. When you go back and look, you know, the I think it was the Tua draft. They draft Austin Jackson and um, missed on a lot of draft picks. Noah Igbenogany. Um, there was there was the other draft um, that I didn't love. That which one was that? Let me let me pull up their 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 draft history. Um, they took Christian Wilkins, which he's a good player. But I said I would have taken Jeffrey Simmons, and then they didn't get anything after that. They got Andrew Van Ginkle in the fifth round, but. You know, they're they're at the end of the day, their drafting just has not been very good for 2019, 2020. Hurt the foundation of that team for a little bit. Um last couple of years, am I gonna change this on the fly? Cause the year just looking at this, the year before that, 2018, Minka Fitzpatrick, Mike Kosicki, Jerome Baker, it's a pretty good draft. And and Chris Greer's been here forever. Two years before that, Laramie Tunsil, Xavier Howard, Kenyon Drake. Maybe it's a little better than I'm giving him credit for, and I'm overreacting to that 2020 draft. Some Dolphins fans will agree with me. Last year they go Jalen Waddle, which was a great pick. Jalen Phillips, Javon Holland. That's a really great draft. All right. We are going to change this on the fly. We're going to move Miami into the good tier, which is it's. I'm glad we um, ended that last tier with Miami because I was kind of wavering on them already. Looking back on the draft history, it's not that bad. It was an excellent offseason, so I think they're doing a good job. Now, my other criticism of them is the Nick Chubb trade. Uh, sorry, the Bradley Chubb trade. I don't think that's going to work out for them. I really don't. I don't think he is a $24 million edge rusher. I would not have traded a first-round pick, certainly, to then um, pay him that much money. I am very suspect of that that acquisition. He's a fine player. Is it going to get them a Super Bowl this year? I I don't think so. It's not entirely impossible, uh, but it's going to make building this team even more difficult without any first round pick and without that cap space, they're going to have to pay Tua very soon as well. So, eh, man, not a fan of that trade. They are kind of the last good team here and the or the first good team in the last fine front office. I, I've, I'm kind of wavering on that one, but um, I will move them up into the good tier. So let's keep moving as we are now into our fourth tier of good front offices, the Cincinnati Bengals. And I I actually should have saved this one for the top of the tier because I really like what the Bengals are doing. Um, They just, some areas leave a little bit to be desired. Like their day three of this draft was so bad. Um, Just from a process perspective, I did not think Zachary Carter, like drafting Zachary Carter to me, I know it's just one pick, but that prospect, he was an undrafted prospect in my opinion. And I just, I can't say that a a, a front office that thought that prospect was an, a third round player, I can't rank that as an elite front office. Um, maybe that's overly harsh, but th- just don't don't throw third round picks in the trash like that in my opinion. <laughs> I think that's fair. But overall, their free agent classes have been phenomenal. And they operate differently than really any other front office. They have fewer scouts than anybody. Uh, Mike Brown, their GM, has been there since 1991, 30 years as their GM. So they have a little bit of an old school mentality there, an old school scouting mentality, but they do make it work. And you can't really argue with the last two years, um, their free agents, Shadobe Awuzie, Trey Hendrickson, Von Bell, uh, maybe three years, Von Bell, DJ Reader, Eli Apple, Mike Hilton, Ted Karras, Alex Kappa, Lyle Collins, all on pretty nice contracts for what they're getting from those guys. That is incredible use of free agency for a front office that gets criticism for not spending money. Bullshit. I mean, 
they they draft Joe Burrow, they draft Jamar Chase, and they have built a really good team around those guys through free agency. I think their drafting has been non-elite. It's been pretty good, though. And uh, Cam Taylor-Britt's playing better for them. So so they, they have a chance to continue impressing and maybe get into that elite conversation. I think they're better than some of these teams we're going to continue talking about in this tier for sure. Uh, by the way, we are not ranking these teams inside of tiers. They were just, they're just clusters because uh, it's, it's too up and down, really. Um, but next, we're staying in the state of Ohio with the Cleveland Browns. And they definitely have potential to be an elite front office. They're another team that I think we could push up this list of good GMs because uh, they've drafted well. They've built really an incredible roster. But I do think, you know, the Deshaun Watson thing is to be determined. Just we got to see him play well. I think there's a lot of potential there to, for that to end up being a good football move for the Cleveland Browns. I can't defend it from an ethical standpoint and i think it's a bad look for those people running the show there but from a football perspective that could prove out to work out for them but the other thing is they have really ignored the interior of that defense which has bothered me they have not done a good job filling out the middle of the defense i think outside like modern construction of the team is pretty good obviously you got miles garrett some great corners martin emerson pick looks awesome but and even Jeremiah Usukoromo is this awesome modern linebacker, but they don't have a mic and they don't have any defensive tackles. And I don't think you can just ignore that position group entirely. It has left that defense rather matchup dependent and one dimensional. And we've seen them plenty of games really get bullied. So I do question that team building philosophy from them, signing Taven Bryan to be your best defensive tackle, a guy that's more of an edge type, a three technique at best. So they've had their hiccups, but the Browns in general, I think, are are very well run. Uh, the Denver Broncos, I'm actually going to put in the good category. I'm actually going to defend um, the the front office on the Russell Wilson trade. I think any of us going back in time would have made that trade 10 out of 10 times for the Broncos because they've built such a good team there. And I also have to look at George... Patton, um, it is George Patton, right? Yeah, George Patton. Um, I, I know things kind of ran their course in Minnesota, but I thought he was a really good GM for the Vikings. You look at why the Vikings are good this year, it's mostly thanks to what George Patton did. That is really George Patton's team, with the exception of, of Zadarius Smith. But you know, I think Patton's been a good drafter. He did draft um, Sertan in, in 2021, I, I believe. And back to the Russell Wilson trade, uh, hindsight is always 2020. I don't think anyone really saw this big of a drop-off from Russ coming, other than maybe Pete Carroll. But I think it was unanimous agreement that the Broncos won that trade. And, and process over results... They needed to get a quarterback. It needed to be either Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson, and they made it happen. I I know it hurts that he's not playing up to standards, but I still think from a process point of view, it was good. I think their drafting is really good. Um, They get Pat Sertan. They get Baron Browning. um, They – Nick Benito looks exciting. This year, uh, Greg Dulcich looks like a good pick in the third round. Like I still think moving forward, yes, the Russell Wilson trade hurts, and it definitely keeps them out of the elite category, but I think these guys know how to team build in Denver. I really do. So I'm still going to put them in a good category because I, because I do trust George Patton. Um, and then we have the Detroit Lions in the good category, and this is definitely trending up. Y- you know... Um, Oh, God, his name always escapes me. I, I didn't write it down because I was like, you'll remember it this time. And now I can't, I can't remember it. Uh, Brad Holmes. It always comes to me like right before I hit enter on Google too. Uh, but we talked about this earlier when we were talking about the Falcons. But I just love the way Detroit has built this team. They come in, new regime. They say, this is going to be a long-term rebuild. We're not going to rush anything. 
We're going to get an adequate quarterback that can run the show. We're going to build up the line play around them, which is now really coming to fruition now. And then we'll attack um, defensive back and, um, you know, receiver. And it's just every every move they make compounds itself and builds upon itself. And I just, I, I can't wait to see what this team looks like when they get into that range of, um, you know, Chiefs, Eagles, Bills, Ravens, teams that are playoff teams that have to maximize value and hit on late first round picks. I think these guys are shaping up to be, to look like a front office that's going to draft well, treat things with value, and do a really good job. We haven't seen it result in organizational success yet, so I can't rank them elite. But Brad Holmes and and that organization, I think, gets it in a way that a lot of TM, uh, a lot of teams and GMs just don't. Then we have the LA Rams, where Brad Holmes came from. So, you know, last year they were they were top dogs. They created a strategy that teams around the league started to replicate this f them picks mentality, where you got to hit in the mid rounds and uh, you know build with with star talent. It is certainly a team-building philosophy. I will say that. They are very lucky that it worked. Now, it worked for a reason. They brought in some incredible players, great coaches, and they got the job done. Now, what happens next is incredibly fascinating. I I like that they picked up Baker Mayfield. They're not just giving up. But, um, yeah, I I mean, there's not a whole lot else to say other than this thing has bottomed out in a hurry. Uh, You see what happens when these guys uh, get hurt. They have like five or six superstars on this team. Stafford gets hurt. Cup gets hurt. Donald gets hurt. And this is just a really bad football team after that. Uh, They don't have any draft picks. They don't have cap space. What happens next is going to be very telling of Les Snead's team building abilities. And and, uh, we'll just have to wait and see. But I still like those guys. I still think they're a good front office. Uh, But they're kind of in a pretty... They're not kind of. They are in a very deep hole right now. Then I have the New England Patriots. Bill Belichick had some down years there for sure. Um, But you look at the entire breadth of work, his ability to, you know, he is unique really in that he is the GM and the coach straight up. And I think the last couple years he has built this roster back up. I wish he was better at finding like a superstar, whether it's at wide receiver or... Um, a superstar defensive player. But you look at the conglomerate of things, his ability to find random players, know exactly what skill sets he wants, and then to deploy it. It is a unique asset that the Patriots have. It's a reason that they're never a bad football team. Um, and they've they've found a lot of value in free agency as well. I mean, Matthew Judon's been incredible. Um, you know, just different pieces I guess offensively they get Dwayne Brown back into the mix he's still a good tackle when he plays um you know Kendrick Bourne was a good value sign he's when when he played last year he was a good player I I I would certainly not put the Patriots towards the top of this tier but they're better than fine um and and they got a lot of crap for the Cole Strange pick he's a good guard You've got Marcus Jones has been a star. Jack Jones has been a star corner this year as a rookie. So I don't think it's controversial to say that Bill Belichick is a good general manager, but I I don't think he's elite at this point. I I don't. Um, There's a lack of upside that they haven't been able to hit. Then the New York Jets, Joe Douglas and these guys, they're definitely at the top, uh, towards the top of this tier with, like, the Bengals, the Browns, uh, and – Probably the Bucks, um, who are still going to come in this tier. But anyway, Joe Douglas, from a drafting perspective, has been incredible. And, and really from a free agency perspective, he's done a really good job as well. The, the thing is, they just if they don't hit on Zach Wilson and it really looks like they have not, they can't be elite. Like That was supposed to be the pick that turned a corner for this organization. I think they've done an excellent job building this roster. It's a very talented, well-distributed team, their draft this year. I mean, they got arguably the two most valuable rookies to come out of this draft right now, Sauce Gardner and Garrett Wilson. You can certainly make that argument. And they got them both. 
with the fourth pick and the tenth pick without having to trade. I mean, that's that's remarkable. So, uh, n- let alone Brees Hall, who looked awesome as a second round pick. So, it, you can't argue with that. I would say top ten for sure for Joe Douglas, but at some point they're going to have to figure out the quarterback and and be a legitimate playoff team, right? Um, then we have. In this tier, um, lost my spot here. Uh, the New Orleans Saints still going to rank as a good front office for me after about four or five years of being one of the best run front offices in the league. The team that I think really got the ball rolling on this idea that the cap doesn't exist, and they were very forward thinking i don't i don't want to say they invented the void year contract but they sure as hell uh normalized it and we are now feeling the repercussions of it but their ability to keep that window alive is truly impressive i mean they kept a championship window open from like 2015 through 2021 with a team that did not look like they were supposed to have a lot of cap space at all. And they just kept retaining talent, kept signing free agents. And um, I think that is that is ultimately an impressive talent from this front office. Now, there is a, a repercussion to it. They have had to let some of these pieces walk, and they are paying for it. The, if you asked me last year, I would have said they're elite. But... I do think that they got a little bit full of themselves this last offseason. I think they were feeling themselves a little bit too much because you lose Sean Payton. You've got Jameis, who looked fine, but is still Jameis, who played like six games, looked okay, and they acted like they could still win a Super Bowl. And to me, that was a mistake, a huge mistake. They trade away their first round pick in in this year's draft and their second round pick next year to get the 19th pick last year to draft a tackle in Trevor Penning, who was a decent prospect, but 19 was like the absolute highest that I would think about Trevor Penning let alone the fact that they actually already had a serviceable left tackle in James Hurst on the roster. And that, to me, was was a criminal offense for this front office. Like, that was just, you are going way too far. Said it at the time, that this has a chance to backfire. Like, if Jameis can't be good, and, and ironically, you know, signing Andy Dalton was a great move for this front office. He's been great for them. And getting Chris Olave was awesome. They had the foresight to look at the receiver market and say, we need to be aggressive to go get that guy. And they were totally right about that. But to currently be handing a top 10 pick to a conference team in the Philadelphia Eagles, whoo, that hurts. That really hurts. If the Eagles end up getting a player like Will Anderson or Jalen Carter as a result of having that pick, whether it's a trade up or something like that, my goodness, my goodness, what an error by the New Orleans Saints. Um, I also don't like trading away Chauncey Gardner-Johnson for nothing. I think that that was a mistake. So I still think they are smart and know what they're doing, but you know, it, it's like the opposite of the Russell Wilson thing, where I defended the process on the Russell Wilson trade. The process on the Saints trade was horrible, and I said it at the time. All right, our next team is the Pittsburgh Steelers. So Omar Khan steps in uh, the last couple of years, new GM. It's really just the machine that is the Pittsburgh Steelers. It doesn't really feel like it matters who their GM is all the time. They're going to promote internally um, and get that done. And, and Omar Khan was an internal promotion, right? Um, I should probably confirm that before I speak. He, yeah, internal promotion was a surprise to nobody. So... Still going to learn a lot about him, but because the Steelers are always such a well-run organization, I can't I can't take them out of the good tier. I know they've had their flaws the last few years. Their drafts, honestly, um, 18, 19, 20, nothing really special, um, but they did find T.J. Watt 
at the end of the first round. I mean, they found one of the best defensive players in the NFL at the end of the first round. Um, I like their draft this year. I honestly, I didn't hate their draft last year. I thought they got good players. It was just a matter of, um, I, I kind of disagreed with like taking a running back in the first round. Certainly not a, a great move. Najee's pretty damn good. He's had an up and down year this year, playing much better lately. I, I know, I know, Steelers fans, you're you're a little bit tired of it, and maybe ranking them good is a little bit too high. Uh, but I I didn't hate the Kenny Pickett pick as much as a lot of people did. I really didn't. I think with the 20th pick, you're expecting something like a Mac Jones, and Kenny Pickett to me looks the part. He looks ready. He looks like he can play. And they now have a four-year window to try and build a really great defense around Kenny Pickett, who's going to have a bunch of great playmakers. For what it's worth, the Steelers have Deontay Johnson, Pickens, who looks great, Pat Fryermuth, who I said was was one of the best value picks in the draft last year. They have an offensive line that is coming together, believe it or not, Dan Moore and, and Chig... Um, Oh, what's his name? At, at right tackle, starting to play better. That interior is actually pretty good. So the Steelers traditionally find really good offensive linemen at a value. They've done that. And uh, we know that Mike Tomlin can coach this defense up, and, and they bring in William Jackson maybe for the future at corner. I really don't think the Steelers are that far off of being a competitive team that can be in the mix and see what happens. And it's just tough. When you're not a horrible football team, you're not going to find yourselves with a lot of opportunities to find superstar quarterbacks. So I think they recognized that and said, you know what, Kenny Pickett is about as good of a prospect as as we're going to find. And let's get the ball rolling on his development and uh, go from there. I wish they had a better offense coordinator, though. So, you know, if you wanted to put the Steelers in the fine category, I think that's reasonable. Uh, but I think I just have too much respect for this organization and and for Mike Tomlin, who's going to have a say, to kind of turn this thing around, which I think the last two drafts, honestly, have not been that bad, in in my opinion. I know before that, there was there was some big misses. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm going to rank them good, even if they're maybe more towards the bottom of this tier. Then I have the Seattle Seahawks. So the Seahawks are very straightforward. They had a really bad run. You know, they they started, you know, John Schneider comes in, has the most memorable draft of the last, you know, decade, really. They build the Legion of Boom in like two years. And then the Legion of Boom falls apart, and this front office was legit one of the three worst teams in the league. Horrible draft philosophy, just couldn't get it done. But I think they look, looked in the mirror a little bit, listened to maybe some outside opinions a little bit more drafted a little bit more based on your sort of consensus rankings, if you will, as opposed to what they've done in the past where they just, they have their own board and their own fits. And that's how you end up with complete reaches. Guys like LJ Collier, Rashad Penny, you know, even Jordan Brooks is a decent player redoing that. I would not have spent a first round pick on him. And even in the second round, they have not hit on a lot of these pass rush types and and different picks there. But, you know, this draft, this last most recent draft, is looking like, honestly, one of those Legion of Boom level drafts. They get two starting tackles. They get a, what, what looks like a superstar running back. They get what looks like a potential superstar cornerback. We'll see what Boye Mafe can do. I mean, this draft is incredible. It is what GMs dream of. Uh, I've always defended John Schneider. I've said he's a good scout. He can turn this thing around, and uh, they have. So you got to rank the Seahawks good because, you know, they had some really down years there, but they built these guys, Pete Carroll and John Schneider, they built the Legion of Boom. That counts for something. And then now they're really building this team back up. Um, and and what they did with the Russell Wilson trade, of course, you, you got to – I think you give them credit for – you give them more credit for recognizing that Russ was was going to be what he is than you you are down on the Broncos for making that trade, I think. Uh, and the haul they got there is incredible. They're going to be getting a top three to five pick from Denver at this point. So uh, the Seahawks definitely good, and if they have more years like this, they're going to be back in that elite category very quickly. 
Then I have the San Francisco 49ers, who are an interesting front office, to say the least. They have their ultra highs. They really do. They mostly hit in the first round, I would say. You know, Javon Kinlaw is not looking great. Well, I guess you can't really say that, you know, because Trey Lance gets hurt, but that's not really their fault. I think Trey Lance, they still believe in him. But they they really do build, a, they get a lot. Where do I want to go with this? I think they find impact players out of nowhere about as good as anybody. Especially on that D-line, like Samson Abuka and and um, Charles Amenahue. At linebacker, Fred Warner and... Uh, and and Drake Greenlaw, even Aziz Al Shair, uh, Drake Jackson looks like he's going to be a good player for them. They're really good in that front. I think on the back end they find a guy like Telenoa Hufanga who fits them really well. They bring in Ward. They they've done a great job to um, repatch that secondary. I mean, defensively, John Lynch has done an excellent job helping build that team. And then offensively, you know, Debo, Kittle, Brandon Ayuk. I think Christian McCaffrey, it goes hand-in-hand with my negative point about them and that they overvalue running backs. But he is freaking awesome. In San Francisco, like the foresight to bring him in here and what a scheme fit he's been, it's it's just working for this offense. They go get Trent Williams is another example of like finding excellent value. And it, it almost doesn't always matter if they waste a first round pick or waste a third round pick on a running back because they know what they need. It's it's almost Belichickian in a lot of ways. So They have some eyesores, right? Javon Kinlaw really just does kind of feel like a bust at this point. I think back-to-back years, burning third-round picks on Trey Sermon and now um, Ty Davis-Price and another third-round pick in the McCaffrey trade. But the way that they're able to rotate guys off the street into the lineup and dominate, pair it with the coaching, and, and Shanahan has a big say here. And what's going on, especially with the offensive moves. But it works. He knows what he needs. Other than running back being that glaring weakness. Uh, and even the offensive line has been a little bit better than they should have been on paper. You know, a guy like Daniel Brunskill at right guard, a guy like their their center. Uh, I can't even think of his name right now. Jake Brendel, I think. He's been actually a pretty good center. So the foresight to say, you know what, I think these guys can play and not invest in that position. Pretty good. Spencer beerford has been okay when he's played. Um the, the guard, the left guard that looked maybe like an overdraft, the Notre Dame kid, he he's turned into a decent guard. So there's just too many things you can go down the list and say, that was a good move, 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 to overreact to, yeah, they burned a few third-round picks on some running backs and Javon Kinlaw was a bust. The Trey Lance thing isn't really their fault. I think the process on getting Trey Lance was pretty good, and there's still plenty of time to tell on if he's going to be a good player for them. Okay, then we got the Tampa Bay Bucks in the good tier. So Jason Light, their general manager, was really at the top of the top. The year they won the Super Bowl, after drafting Tristan Wirfs and Antoine Winfield, really built that Super Bowl team. Really did. Vita Vea, a big part of that team. The cornerbacks, the way they attacked that secondary, getting guys like Carlos Davis, Sean Murphy bunting, he deserves a ton of credit for building that championship team. Chris Godwin, I think, was a Jason Light draft pick. Uh, they bring in Gronk and the the old line. Like they built the best roster in football. And then a year after that, they did a great job to sustain that roster. And heading into this year, it looked like they were doing a better job. Um, but the last couple drafts have really not been all that. They draft. Joe Tryon Tryinka, Kyle Trask, and I think the running back, the the Vanderbilt running back. I mean, that draft is pretty much a wash. Tryinka's been fine, but that draft I didn't love, and it hasn't been great. 
Look at last year. They trade into the second round. They take the Houston rusher. Um, Logan, what's his name? Logan, I almost said Logan Paul. Um, what's his name? I'm going to, I'm going to look this up real quick. Um, Logan Hall. Yeah. Like he was basically their first round pick. Okay. Whatever. Luke Goddick in the second round. I liked Luke Goddick, but that was a little rich. Uh, that hasn't really worked out. Rashad White in the third round, K. Dotton in the fourth. But you know they haven't really replenished this roster very well, and all they've really done is kick the can down the road. So I think you got to move them out of the elite tier. I really do. Just because the last couple off seasons have been really all about just cap management, retaining guys, and their way to re- restore this draft was to draft well, and they've stopped doing that. So. A little bit of a knockdown for Jason Light, but I still believe in those guys because because they did such a great job uh, building that Super Bowl team. And then the last team we haven't mentioned yet that I think some people are going to be surprised by, I, I wouldn't necessarily rank them at the top of this tier, but the Washington Commanders. I think Martin Mayhew, the GM there, very quietly, like under the radar, a very solid, good front office. Most of their moves, I think, make sense. And... We t- spend so much time talking about Dan Snyder and how bad the ownership is and how the stadium's a piece of shit and how they don't have a quarterback. And part of that is on the GM. But for the most part, they've drafted pretty well. They've built a really well-rounded team. I think what they've done with the offensive line is remarkably impressive. I mean, Sam Cosme in the second round was a hell of a pick. I thought he was a first-round guy all the way. He's been a, He looks like a franchise right tackle. They let Brandon Sheriff go. But I think that was a solid move. They replaced him with some veteran guards uh, who are playing well. And um, I want to say Mayhew was the guy that would assign Charles Leno from Washington. I mean, another great job identifying a franchise left tackle that Chicago never should have let out the building. Um, Defensively, they've done a great job finding guys in the secondary. Benjamin St. Juice looks like a guy in the third round. They get uh, Derek Forrest. They get... Um, uh, Cam Curl has been awesome as a seventh round pick. So they have found some really good players. And really, they just they got to figure out the quarterback. And I think the Carson Wentz move, I actually defended it a little bit because I was like, I th- A, I think people are overreacting to the loss against Jacksonville. You know, I think we're seeing Carson Wentz in hindsight. He wasn't as bad in Indianapolis as I think the narrative was. Like, I think Carson Wentz is still a starting caliber quarterback. Is he a great player? Is he a long-term answer? No, absolutely. But they got they gave up a third-round pick for Carson Wentz. Okay, whatever. Like, that's fine. They looked at this draft class, and they were like, I mean, they clearly evaluated it. They ended up drafting Sam Howell, but they looked at the draft class, they were like, none of these guys are the answer. What was your other option? You know, go trade. You know, Russell Wilson didn't even want to come there. So, I don't know. They tried something. So I, I I do think Washington has built a very good roster. It's just, you know, their coaching to me is fine. <laughs> I don't think their coaching does a whole lot of elevating. And the quarterback, obviously, is something they still got to figure out. But I think Martin Mayhew and the, and the Washington Commanders are are pretty well-run team. They draft pretty dang well. So that rounds out our good tier, and then we get into the elite tier. And this is going to start for me with the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, the Chiefs have had some misses. I think the trade for um, Frank Clark has hurt this defense over the last couple of years. They gave up so much just cap-wise and draft pick-wise. Just not a great use of resources there. Um. Beyond that, have they done a ton of really terrible stuff? I mean, we're ranking them elite for a reason, right? For the most part, they draft really well. They have continued to sustain talent. You know, nobody thought, and ultimately they did lose Tyree Kill, actually, but nobody thought for a while there, you know, for a couple of years, really, they could keep Chris Jones, Patrick Mahomes, and um, and Tyreek, and Kelsey. They got it done. They kept the team intact. They've drafted well. I like their draft this year. And 
you know, the, the way they traded free agency. They did the opposite of the Packers, right? The Packers trade away their receiver and completely rely on rookies. The Chiefs are like, no, we're going to go get MVS and Juju and still have a good offensive uh, offensive core here. Oh, and by the way, their drafting of offensive linemen is incredible. Now, I think they've managed the Orlando Brown situation well, not giving him that massive contract, although they were willing to do it. Um, it was a good decision. You know, tra- Doing a first, second round pick swap for a tackle that caliber I think is fine. I didn't love that trade, but... They signed Joe Tooney, who's one of the best guards in football. They have they find Creed Humphrey in the second round, thanks to Green Bay drafting Creed Humphrey, um, uh, drafting Josh Myers over Creed Humphrey, who, who might be the best center in football. They draft Trey Smith uh, in in the sixth round. They're incredible uh, at some of these draft picks. So to me, the Chiefs are a elite front office. They might be the last of this elite group because they do have some hiccups in there, but for the most part. They build a championship caliber team every year. They draft well. They do free agency well. And you can't really argue with the results. The Dallas Cowboys are left here. And this is maybe the most controversial ranking. You know, Jerry Jones gets a lot of crap. And I've actually defended Jerry Jones on this channel. You know, I get it. It's it's America's team. And he's the loudest owner and the most powerful owner. And nobody likes the Cowboys. Blah, blah, blah. This is one of the best front offices in the league. I don't care what you say. They've consistently built incredible teams in Dallas on paper. Now, for one reason or another, coaching, injuries, it hasn't led to a championship. Maybe this is the year. But just look at the last couple years. And really just their drafting in general has always been good to me. They always draft really well. No one ever talks about it. But look at the last couple drafts for the Dallas Cowboys. Let me pull them up. Just the last two years. 2021, they draft Micah Parsons, Kelvin Joseph, who could still work out, still a young player, talented when he plays, off-field stuff there. Osa Odigazua in the third round. They take Jabril Cox in the fourth round, who can play. And then you get to 2022, Tyler Smith actually looks like a pretty good pick. Sam Williams has been a good player. They take... Uh, Jake Ferguson's been an impact for them. And then you actually, I, I meant to go back to 2020 when I meant last two drafts. Um, anyway, C.D. Lamb with the 17th pick, Trayvon Diggs with the 51st pick, Tyler Biadesh, a starting center in the fourth round. 2019, they didn't have a first-round pick, but they take Connor McGovern in the third round, Tony Pollard in the fourth round, Donovan Wilson in the sixth round. That's an incredible draft, considering they didn't have a first. The year before that, Leighton Van Der Esch, far from a bust of a first-round pick. Injuries have, have held him back, but he's still playing. Connor Williams got a big free agent contract, was a good player for them. Michael Gallup, Dorrance Armstrong's been awesome. Dalton Schultz. Mike White, <laughs> they were right about Mike White being a player. Cedric Wilson in the sixth round. I mean, those are hell of a draft. All the way to 2017, yeah, Taco Charlton in the first round was a bust, but Shadobi Awuzie, one of the best corners in the NFL, well, you know, top 10 to 15 corner in the NFL. They couldn't afford to keep him. Jordan Lewis, still starting for them. Xavier Woods, a good safety. Noah Brown in the seventh round is a decent receiver. And the year before that, they drafted Dak Prescott in the fourth fucking round. So don't tell me the Cowboys aren't a good drafting team. They're one of the best in the league. And they don't always have a ton of cap space to get crazy in free agency. They would if they they could. But they fill holes about as good as anybody. You know, last year, Malik Malik Hooker, J. Ron Kirst, they brought in um, the other safety who's in Pittsburgh now, uh, Demonte Kazee. All solid hole fillers on that back end after losing some guys. Uh, This year, Anthony Barr, Jonathan Hankins. They do a good job getting active in free agency to fill what holes they do have, which aren't many. So the Cowboys are legitimately one of the best front offices in the NFL, even though people say, oh, Jerry's got to give the team up. Like, bullshit. They draft great. They use their money well. Now, like... Yeah, you could argue the Amari Cooper trade was bad value for sure. 
Um, I think they had some good foresight on Lyle Collins, to be honest. He wasn't worth paying. He's been fine for, for the Bengals, but Terrence Steele's been better at right tackle, as he was last year when, when they were competing at right tackle. So, uh, Oh, and by the way, they found Terrence Steele as an undrafted free agent. The dude's like a top half right tackle. So the Cowboys are awesome <laughs> as a front office, and I don't think a lot of people realize it. So I'm going to rank them as an elite uh, front office in the league. Um, then I have the Baltimore Ravens, and I know Ravens fans are fed up that they haven't gotten a receiver. And a big part of that is Rashad Bateman got hurt, and it sucks. Um, I think that is a legitimate criticism, but beyond that, I mean, they're the reason you have Lamar to begin with as an MVP with the last pick in the first round. I mean, that's a starting point. They are constantly finding and churning out new offensive linemen, defensive linemen, big years this year from Justin Matabuike, Broderick Washington. Um, you know, they go and get Roquan, who's like completed this defense. Their secondary is awesome. Kyle Hamilton looks legit. The Ravens are one of the best drafting teams every single year. They are active in free agency when they need to be. They go and get Marcus Williams, who again, unfortunately got hurt, but he looked awesome when he came in. Now, yeah, you wish um, you wish the receiver position had worked out a little bit better, but you got to remember as well, a point I always make, and I'm not excusing the front office, front office entirely, I think they could have made a move for another receiver that's a legitimate piece. Whether that's a guy like DJ Chark or maybe a Corey Davis, like something like that, maybe. But overall, they do run a very unique system that doesn't throw the ball outside the numbers a ton. They put a higher emphasis on tight ends and slot receivers. And they have a quarterback that, let's face it, has been hit or miss deep outside the numbers over the last few years. He can drop dimes, but he will overthrow guys there as well. So, um, that would be the one knock, but I still think the Ravens are an elite front office and Ravens fans have nothing to be worried about with Eric DaCosta in charge. Then I have the Buffalo Bills. This one's very straightforward. I mean, their team building, they, you know, what, what Detroit, I think what Detroit is trying to do right now is taking a lot of influence from the Bills because when the Bills put this team together, everything, you know, you go back to when they drafted Josh Allen. This was not a good roster. This was not a good team. Everything they've done has stacked and stacked and stacked. And you're, you're critical of a team like the Atlanta Falcons, for example, for never taking that next step, or the Indianapolis Colts. The Bills understood what the value positions are, and offensive line, pass rusher, cornerback, and they have continued to invest in those positions. The moves they make have been built around the idea of building a defense, building uh, a surrounding core for a quarterback, going to get Stephon Diggs, drafting a Gabe Davis. Everything they've done has made sense, and there's really no arguing that the Buffalo Bills are one of the elite front offices in the league. And then the last one here, and th this one I saved for last because they are number one, and maybe they deserve their own tier. Uh, the elite of the elite. The Philadelphia Eagles, Howie Roseman. He is running circles around the NFL right now. The roster in place in Philadelphia, I don't think people realize how special it is. And there are, we, we could do a whole podcast breaking down the individual moves that Howie Roseman has done over the last two years, really, to turn this thing out. It has been one of the most impressive front office masterclass windows that I've, I've seen. And he, the people were down on Howie. And how could you not be? He drafts J.J. Ortega Whiteside over D.K. Metcalf. He drafts Jalen Rieger over Justin Jefferson. And that hurts. But he has since brought in Devonta Smith and A.J. Brown. I think he's made up for the wide receiver misses, you guys. I think he has. And just a little bit more than that. Um, I mean, seriously, like I said, you could do a whole podcast episode, starting with the offensive line, um, getting Landon Dickerson in the second round, drafting Cam Jurgens to replace Travis Kelsey someday, finding a guy uh, as a depth piece like um, um, Jack Driscoll, who was one of my draft darlings, who's just a good guard tackle backup. They have... 
I mean, Andre Dillard's a former first-round pick just hanging around here. He can play when he's out there. Oh, Jordan Maialata, seventh-round pick, one of the best tackles of football. They work things out with Lane Johnson and get him back. Like the offensive line, master class. Receiver, complete master class. They, they draft Dallas Goddard. They filled that group in. Um, quarterback, I mean, what they did, moving on from Carson Wentz, drafting Jalen Hurts, I didn't think that was a good move. How he did, and my God, he was right. I mean, to believe in Jalen Hurts, to develop, to the quarterback he is now, that is that is Howie Roseman. And and Doug Peterson, I think, was was the the final, you know, got the final say on that one. But defensively, they are it feels like they never have an issue with the D line because they're constantly replacing that group. Josh Sweat was a great pick. He's a good player. Hassan Reddick signing him. I question that move. He's been a good impact. Uh they signed Javon Hargrave. That made a ton of sense. They still have Fletcher Cox. They draft Jordan Davis. They have Milton Williams just hanging out there. Uh, they sign some cheap free agents. They get Robert Quinn in the building, and Dominican Sue, Linval Joseph, master class there. Linebacker. That's probably where they leave a little bit to be desired, but hey, TJ Edwards was a great undrafted pickup. A ton of value there. They draft Nicobe Dean in the third round. They sign Kaiser White for nothing. Could be a lot worse. Oh, don't even get me started on the secondary. They trade a third round pick for Darius Slay. Are you kidding me? One of the best corners in the NFL for a third round pick. James Bradbury off the street for nothing after your division rival had to cut him. Avante Maddox, a third-round pick, one of the best slot corners in the NFL. That's a master class. Uh, look at the back end. Could be worse. Uh, I mean, it could be better, but they trade a fucking sixth-round pick for the league leader in interceptions. In Chauncey Gardner-Johnson, who's super talented, someone that has been consistently undervalued. Uh, the Saints somehow got him in the third round. I thought he was a first-round talent. Um, the other safety spot's fine, let alone the fact that they pick up the Saints' first-round pick this year. Oh, yeah, they have the best roster in the NFL, but um, they have a first-round pick from one of the worst teams in the league. So there is no argument. Howie Roseman is the best general manager in the NFL right now, and you can't even really think about the whole Justin Jefferson DK Metcalf thing at this point because of everything he's done to make up for it. So, uh, yeah, Howie Roseman, elite masterclass, top GM in the league. Uh, and that's uh, that's going to round out our GM rankings. You guys have been asking for it for a long time. I think I showed why it's taken a while for us to do this. This is a fun thought experiment that takes about an hour to get through. Um, but we are going to wrap up the show with our Patreon mailbag. We have some excellent questions here. So again, guys, if you want to support the show and become a part of the mailbag, patreon.com slash that franchise guy. Thank you to my patrons for your questions this week. And let's get into it. From Luke, from your perspective, what is the main cause of the struggles for the Seahawks defensive um, struggles for the Seahawks defense this year? Is it coaching, scheme, lack of talent, or a mix of both? Pretty easy answer for me. It is a lack of talent. I know we praised their draft, but they were starting with probably the worst defensive roster in the league. Um, I, they don't have good pass rushers, especially on the edge. They do have holes in the secondary. You know, the, the injury to Jamal Adams, not that he's a great cover player, but that that's not great. I mean, Josh Jones has not been good. They just picked up Jonathan Abram. Uh, Quandre Diggs continues to be a relatively overrated player. He makes plays, but he does get beat quite a bit as well. They just have a lot of porous spots in the secondary there uh, and they're not getting good, good pass rush up front so they're overachieving as a team but the defense was never supposed to be good so it, it, they just they need more time to fill in spots there and, and Michael Jackson's been a fun corner he's been physical and made some plays uh, but he is far from uh, a starting caliber guy in my opinion okay from Will are Burrow and Herbert still a tier above Tua and Hurts or have all four guys started to mix together well, I think Burrow has transcended above. I think my conversations on him the last couple weeks, that's not going to be a surprise. I think Burrow has probably entered that tier with Mahomes and Allen and him, and I think that's it. I think Herbert and Tua and Hertz are certainly closing the gap. You know, we Herbert definitely has the hardest job of the three, and if he got to play for the Eagles this year, I think we all feel pretty good saying, You'd rather have Herbert than Hurts on that Eagles team. 
Um, but you also got to credit Hertz for playing at, at a near MVP level on that team. So that gap is closing. I still think Herbert would probably be more in a more solidified tier above Tua and Hertz. Um, but that gap is certainly closing with those guys for sure. From Matthew, what do you do? And, and I, I just want to add one more thing. You know, if you're ranking how they're playing this year, Tua and Hertz have played better than Herbert. But the difference is we can clearly see the Chargers team is going south and the Dolphins and Eagles have two of the best surrounding casts for any quarterback in the league. So if if you're talking about ranking quarterbacks like full scale, not just within the season, when you're talking about two players, Hertz and Tua, who have put on bad tape in the NFL, Herbert hasn't put on a lot of bad tape in the NFL, and even this year it hasn't been bad. It just hasn't been amazing. You want to see a longer sample size of those guys playing maybe with less less talent around them or to do it at a continued, you know, continue that trajectory for a longer period of time. Okay, for Matthew, what do you do if you're the Broncos GM this season? No cap room or draft capital, and you're stuck with cooked Russ. My only thought would be to hire Shane Waldron, try to salvage anything from Russ. Yeah, I mean, the Broncos, they don't have much of a choice they are going to have to run this thing back. I do think you're probably best off trying something else with the coach. But you run this thing back, you get Tim Patrick back healthy, Jerry Judy hopefully healthy, you get Javante Williams back healthy. You hope you can get a better version of this offense next year with a different coordinator. I don't think that's crazy to say. You know, even like, you know, Russ has clearly not met expectations. You're going to be overpaying him. You overpaid for him. But he's still, I think, a quarterback you can win with if you find value elsewhere. And you still got Pat Sertan on a rookie contract. You have a couple of young edge rushers that could maybe take a next step up. Like, it's not all doom and gloom for the Broncos. I think they have a chance to have a bounce back season. And and shit, this has been worse than I expected. But I even said coming into the year that, you know, I had the Broncos at 7 and 10. I was like, I don't know. This this could take a little bit more time than we realize. So it definitely doesn't feel great right now, but you know, the defense has been great, right? So you you improve the offense a little bit, get some pieces back, a new play caller, and uh they can turn things around and be a much more competitive team. From Honk Boy, I've been looking ahead to my Panthers offseason, shocker. And I've come to think that Carolina should make an adjustment to a 3-4 Blitzburg, New York Giants-esque attacking defense. Should they make this change? And um, yes, I am. I, I totally see it. I would love that. You know, maybe Todd Bowles becomes available if he gets fired, something like that, um, or just hire a, a defensive coordinator that's been under Wink Martindale. I don't know. But yeah, I like it. I do. I think you have the corners to run press man with JC and and those guys. And um, the the pass rush definitely makes sense with Derek Brown as your kind of Vita Vea, Dexter, Lawrence type as that big bodied space eater in the middle, athletic guys to to move around. I, I like it. I really do. Uh, I think Etor Gross Matos can be a good stunt man there too. Uh, okay, from J O R. One narrative I really disagree with is that the Rams mortgage their future in a trade-off for five to ten years of mediocrity. I don't understand this thought process. It only takes teams two good off-seasons to turn things around, see teams like the Jets, Seahawks. I, I see where you're going with this question. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some exaggeration when it comes to how long the Rams screwed themselves. I think that's something they understand. Like, And, and there's a benefit to hitting rock bottom as well, right? Like you get theoretically a chance at a high end draft pick in 2026 to get a new quarterback. Like the window makes sense. All these guys have like two or three years left in their prime. Go for it. Well, while you have Aaron Donald and Cooper cup and Stafford, Jalen Ramsey, go for it. And then hit, hit rock bottom and a smart team can turn things around in two or three years. So yeah, I, I think that's probably something we don't realize enough as a general football cohort. 
is that the downside to going all in is a little bit less than people want to say. But you got to actually be prepared to go all like you got to be ready to your soup you got to win a Super Bowl. Like you got to get it done if you're going to do that. Otherwise you're going to go through some tough years. From Quoth the Raven Uh, I love this question. PFF is a great resource, obviously, but which positions do PFF grades not matter as much as others? So I think that um, the line grades are probably the best. They're not perfect, but they're probably the best. I think receivers pretty good. Tight ends pretty good. Um. Really, the, the positions that I would say to take with a grain of salt would be quarterback because I do think it's really difficult to have a grading system that can't separate a surrounding cast. And you're going to grade, if you have receivers open, if you have time to throw consistently, you're going to have a lot more opportunities for positive graded throws, right? So that is something that a PFF grade really struggles to separate. That's why you look at the individual stats, average depth of target, um, turnover worthy plays, big time throws, time to throw. Those are much more useful tools than the actual passing grade itself. Um, The other thing is their coverage grades. PFF themselves admit that it's, it's a work in progress trying to get a good coverage system. I think it has improved a little bit. But the thing is, like, there's an overemphasis on when the player is targeted. Did they give up a catch? Like, I've I've watched a game. I think it was the Chiefs-Bengals game last year, and the first one. And Chavarius Ward did a great job on Jamar Chase. But he, they went after him. They targeted him, like, six times. And Jamar Chase, like, mossed him a couple times. But there was a bunch of reps as well where he had really impressive coverage, press coverage, took Jamar Chase out of the play. And those aren't always reflected because the targets get overemphasized. Corner is much more about every single play, every single position. And, um, you know, the line grades are doing a better job of grading that. The corner ones, I think they just implemented... This year, I think, they have a new team that's charting perfectly covered plays. And I hope they find a way to integrate that into the coverage grade much more. Um, Because right now, it's just just very streaky. And they will say it themselves. The coverage grade is the most high variance, week-to-week, year-to-year grade that they have. So I would say coverage grades, especially for corners, safeties, and, and linebacker, too, is tough. Um, I would say from that second level on of the defense and quarterback are where I take everything with more of a grain of salt. From Brendan, assuming the Bucks won't make the Super Bowl this year, do you think that the Bucks would be better off trying to maximize one more season with the talent they do have, guys like Evans, David, Jensen back, or blowing it up at the end of the season? This team still feels like it can compete next season. So, yeah, I I think you try to compete um, because your division's kind of a shit show. The Saints are probably only getting worse. You've got the Panthers. Who knows where they'll be? The Falcons kind of stuck in the middle right now. They definitely will have the best roster non-quarterback next year. Uh, Does Brady want to come back? That's the big question, especially if Brady wants to come back. Yes. But even then, I would say, yeah, go see if... You can make a run with maybe a Dalton or Goff or, you know, something like that, whatever veteran, Jimmy Garoppolo maybe. He can replace Brady for the second time or theoretically replace him. Something like that where you're bringing in a low-end starter and you hope you have an elite team around him. There's no reason the Bucks, um, Shaq Barrett's in, been out for the year as well. There's no reason the Bucs can't be really good next year. Their roster is still really good. I definitely don't think they're a blow-it-up team quite yet. Um, so, yeah. But I do think there's a decent chance Brady's out of there. From Aaron, if the Lions can't get one of the top two quarterbacks, should they even draft one? They seem ready to compete. 
the rest of the quarterbacks in the draft seem like projects. I think the project route is perfect for them. And I honestly, if I'm them, I'm not drafting C.J. Stroud based on what I've seen. Because I think he can be Jared Goff. <laughs> he, I know I just mentioned Jared Goff to the, to the Bucks, but why not have Jared Goff come back, spend one of those picks on Will Levis or Anthony Richardson? Yeah, they're a project, but that's a great spot for a project. Sit for a year or two. You still have another high first-round pick to reinvest in the team. You get Jamison Williams back. It's, it is a perfect situation to develop a quarterback. Um, so I, you say top two quarterbacks, you know, I don't think they're getting Bryce Young. Bryce Young to the Texans is a lock at this point. The question for them is, you know, do they go with Levis or Richardson? I think either of those guys are fascinating projects for them. All right. From Sheldon, another week, another rookie rankings question. This time O-line. Cole Strange, Tyler Linderbaum, Dylan Parham, Cordell Volson. I would go Tyler Linderbaum, Cole Strange, Dylan Parham, Cordell Volson. I'm still not sold on Cordell Volson. I know Bengals fans are excited because he stepped in, and yeah, he's been better than the bust of a pick that was the Jackson Carmen, but I would still be worried about Cordell Volson long term unless he gets a lot better. From uh, especially in pass protection, from Patrick Hill, rank these QBs based on who you think is the best shot to win a starting job and succeed with their current team: Jordan Love, Trey Lance, Sam Howell, Matt Corral, Desmond Ritter. So you say succeed. Let's say succeeding is getting a second contract with their team. I think Sam Howell's pretty low just because he, he was a fifth round pick and there was some really concerning stuff at UNC he has a chance he has theoretical upside it's a good team around him but I just don't know if he's ever going to get that opportunity necessarily because I don't think they're going to roll into next year and be like Sam Howell's our guy I think it's going to be someone else and if they draft if they end up drafting someone else I think Howell's probably end up ending up on the trade block so I would say Howell's last then I would probably go Matt Corral because similarly, I think they'll be in the quarterback market. Now, I think Corral was a higher draft pick, obviously, and them, I could see them, you know, like I think Washington knows they're a quarterback away, so they might get a little more aggressive to go get that guy. Carolina, I think, might be able to be a little bit more patient and be like, you know what, let's see what our third round pick in Matt Corral has. Whether or not he's good, that's to be determined. But I would go, I would go Corral second to last. Then I'd go Desmond Ritter because I do think we have to see him play this year, right? Like he's got to be starting. Atlanta's got a bye week coming up. He is going to see the field at some point. He's just got to. Um, and then, and then I would say Jordan Love. With their current team, you say, I think Jordan Love next. He's gonna they they said they're gonna pick up his fifth year option. I feel pretty confident at this point saying Jordan Love's a starting caliber quarterback. Whether that's gonna be in Green Bay or not, I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh it it Aaron Rodgers will be the starter next year. And then does Rodgers retire after next year? Do they trade Rodgers after next year? Do they trade Love next year? I don't know where that goes. That's a coin toss to me. I believe in Jordan Love at this point, but you still got to go Trey Lance at the top of that. I mean, they spent the third overall, they, they spent two, what, three first-round picks to get him. Incredibly talented dude. He's super young. They, I think, still, and especially now with Jimmy Garoppolo getting hurt, I think this question probably came in, yeah, this question came in before Jimmy got hurt, so maybe that changes that a little bit, but with Jimmy getting hurt again, they just know. That was a big reason they, they got Trey Lance to begin with, was Jimmy can't stay healthy. So um, they know that about Jimmy G. Trey Lance will be their starter next year, and I still think he can have a lot of success there. I really do. 
Okay, from Edward Green. This one's pretty straightforward, and you guys know my answer to it, but would you rather start a franchise with Herbert or Tua? Whose offense would you use? It's still Herbert. Um, you know, Tua has played great. I'm not necessarily down on Tua, but Herbert's just shown too much more. He's more physically talented. And you just you still got to go Herbert. Uh, whose offense would I use? I want Herbert in Brian Dable's offense that is like all crossing routes. Shallow crossers, deep crossers, posts, you name it. Push the ball downfield, get vertical, get him good protection, get him on the move on play actions. Do pretty much anything other than what you're doing <laughs> with him on the Chargers. Okay, we still got a good list of questions here. So... From AJ the Quad Father, Josh Jacobs is having an offensive player of the year type season, and he's a free agent this offseason. What team should go after him, and what would be a reasonable contract for a player of his caliber? Well, I still think the most most likely outcome is the Raiders actually extend him because he's been so good for them. They will be creating a running there's not a ton of running back holes. And given how much success they've had with him, I think they work something out and bring him back. Now, if that doesn't happen, I think of any sort of power gap offense. So, I mean, New Orleans came to mind, but that wouldn't work. The Houston Texans really come to my mind, but they have Damian Pierce. This is the problem with running backs. There's so many good ones, so maybe not the Texans. This always happens. I say a team, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, they have that guy. So... You know, would the Eagles look to upgrade? Can they fit that into the cap? I think Sanders is also a free agent. That could be fun. Uh, the Ravens. I think the Ravens with their offense could really benefit from... I mean, think of the difference between when they had Mark Ingram. Actually, I know we laugh at Mark Ingram now, and he fell off quickly. But he was outstanding in Lamar's MVP season. Because on read options, they have to be honest about the inside dive. And right now, they don't. teams don't care. But Josh Jacobs on that team would be a ton of fun. So the Ravens would, would maybe be a ton of um, interest there. Then you go... You know, I don't think the Bills could afford it, but that would be fun. The Chiefs, same deal. Lions. Lions would make a ton of sense. They've... They like DeAndre Swift, but they love Gap. Lions might be my pick there. Because think of how they use Jamal Williams. Josh Jacobs could actually hit those holes, but then turn them into big chunk runs. I would go, okay, Lions, Ravens, Raiders. Those are my three teams for Josh Jacobs. Okay, from Ashbro. Um, this is kind of a tough question, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. Coaching this year has been weird. Doug Peterson can coach. Frank Reich looks bad. Zach Taylor makes adjustments. And Pete Carroll was the one covering Russell Wilson's flaws. Here's my question. What head coach GM combos can legitimately win a Super Bowl? Well, that's kind of a weird question to say can legitimately win a Super Bowl. But I like how you reword this. For example, I can never see the Cardinals doing anything with their head coach GM combo. But with the Giants duo, I can see a future where they hoist a Lombardi. So, basically, if you remove roster talents, what would be your top 10 picks of head coach GM combos? So, if I were drafting head coach GM combos, let's go through our list. And I think Philly, in, in no particular order, Philly, Buffalo, Baltimore, you know, Harbaugh's stock is down, but I still think they can win a Super Bowl. Uh, Dallas is funny because McCarthy isn't necessarily the coach I want, but I want their assistance. So we won't we won't include Dallas because um, I wouldn't necessarily want McCarthy. I want their assistance. Kansas City for sure. Washington, I would not say so. Tampa, I'm going to say no. San Fran, I still say yes. I still think John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan can get it done. Seattle, I'm honestly, am I that high in Pete Carroll? I'll say no, for not top 10 for the sake of this. Pittsburgh, maybe. 
Jets, I think, with Joe Douglas and Robert Salah, I think they're in the top 10. Saints, no. Belichick, you got to include because he's Bill. So is that six teams, I think? So to recap, we've had Philly, Buffalo, Baltimore, Kansas City, San Francisco, Jets, that's six, New England, seven. Rams, if you remove everything, you got to include Les Snead and Sean McVay, so that's eight. Detroit, definitely someday. Denver, no. Cleveland, I think I think Stefanski and Andrew Barry could. I still like Stefanski. Cincinnati, yes. Miami, yes. I mean, there's a lot more than ten. Depending on, you know, which which version of the question you're going with, um, but I would go with those ten, and then I would I would um, round up New York because I agree, Dable and and Joe Shane seem um, seem like a good a good combo. We just have a smaller sample size on those guys. From Cerberus, I uh, watch a lot of John Boys. Uh, while I don't completely agree, I do broadly agree that removing the kickoff and replacing it with something else sounds not only safer but more interesting in terms of variety. A popular suggestion would be to replace the kickoff with the option to either give the other team the ball on the 25 as if it was a touchback or attempt a 4th and 10 from your own 33-ish yard line, similar to an onside. Um, personally, I hate it. I don't see... I mean, how many injuries do we truly see on kickoffs? Is it that bad? I don't know. Um, I like the kickoff. Now, I'd remove it in overtime because I think it's bullshit that you can win on a kick return touchdown in re- in in a standard in a regular season game. I would just say, I mean, you guys know my thoughts on the on the overtime kickoff. Give them the ball in the forty and play college over overtime rules on your own forty, basically, um, more or less. I'm not going to revisit the overtime discussion there, but um, no, I I don't agree. I said keep kickoffs. I don't notice that many injuries. From Caleb, I'd like to preface this by saying I think the Texans should take Bryce Young at one. However, I don't think it should be as obvious as people are saying. Texans roster is legitimately horrendous. I think drafting a Will Anderson and another cornerstone piece with their Cleveland pick would set them up better to take a quarterback in 2024. To maximize a rookie quarterback contract, especially with guys like Caleb Williams and Drake May around the corner. Um, the only reason I think they don't do this is because GMs generally don't have that long of a leash. Well, I think in Houston they might because they understand this is a, a long-term rebuild. I like your thinking there. I do. I would just say that I don't think they're. I don't think offensively their roster is that bad. I really don't. I think their O line is set up relatively well. I really do. They need a couple pieces there, but that's findable. And I think their receiving core is far from, like, I mean, Brandon Cooks, I think, will be back, especially once you kind of get a new quarterback. That's the other thing is, just from a locker room perspective, these guys are sick and fucking tired of losing. They're going to get a new coach, a new quarterback, and I think there's a vibe in the building of, like, Let's let's become a real team again. And I think a new coach will be like, yeah, I'll come I'll come coach for Bryce Young. Like if is that uh, Shane Steichen or who it might be, Shane Waldron, I don't know, but that I think is the vibe. Let's get this thing going. But you got Brandon Cooks, John Mechie coming back who was as I've said was Bryce Young's chemistry guy when Bryce Young expand uh, extended plays, it wasn't Jamison Williams reading the defense and coming open in front of Bryce Young's face. I know that's a line, but you know what I'm saying like Young's extending. He's looking for someone to work back to him. Mechie was the guy with the IQ to do that. Um, and Nico Collins is a player. Nico Collins has been fine despite horrible quarterback play. You got best left tackle in football. You have a first-round pick at left guard. Your right tackle needs to be extended. Titus Howard, he's fine. So center and guard, you figure that out. I really don't think their offensive roster is a nightmare. Defensively, yes, they have to keep building things, but they have plenty of picks to do that. So to me, I, I see what you're thinking, but I'm still getting the ball rolling because you got to become a real team again. 
it's like the, you know Pinocchio turning into a real boy. You got to get the culture out of this rut of like we are a fake NFL football team because once you get a guy like Bryce Young, that complete that can completely change anything. Think of the Bengals pre and post Joe Burrow. I think it can have a similar effect in Houston. From Micah, could you explain to me the different D line techniques, the difference between even an odd man fronts? So, yeah, the main difference there, and there's different terminologies depending on the system, but the main difference is an odd front is going to have a nose tackle of some kind where you're either straight up on the center or a shade of the center. And even front, you're usually leaving that A-gap exposed. So even fronts are going to be more um, nickel. Fronts are typically even. You can go um, with an odd front out of a nickel defense, but it's more typical to see, like, uh, head up on the, you know, like, two, three techniques or... Um, it really just depends on how much you're shading that nose tackle. Um, you know, think of it this way. If you, if you're even, you're leaving both sides of the center evenly covered. If you're going an odd front, you're more shading towards one side and you're asking a nose tackle to, to cover two gaps there. Uh, so I hope that explains it. And then you can get into base defenses, right? So like you're typically, your three, four fronts are going to be odd fronts with a nose tackle. And you're, you're, and, and you also, you'll often hear odd and bear often brought into the same conversation, uh, a, a bear front and an odd front. But um, an even front is more often going to be your typical four, three kind of stack fronts. Uh, but those defenses are dying off anyway. So um, that's the main difference in those. Um, but you can you can go way deeper than that. Um, and it's not as simple as I laid it out either. Uh, Chase, is this year's wide receiver class one of the best ever through year one? It is up there. I mean, the one with Evans and Odell, Sammy Watkins was really good for a while. That one always comes to my mind as far as top-end talent. The one with, I mean, Jefferson. Was it, uh, was that Ruggs' class, though? Or was that Waddle? No, okay, Waddle was with Devonta Smith and CD. That class is incredible. And then you had, yeah, the Jefferson class. There, Every year, these classes seem to keep getting better. Um, I don't know if the top-end talent is going to be what was Jamar Chase's class? 2020. So 2020, let's let's just do a little digging here. Um can I sort this by receivers? No. Well, just looking at the top, you had 2020. That was okay, I am all over the place. 2020 at CD Lamb, Justin Jefferson. Henry Ruggs, Ayuk, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman, Chase Claypool, Van Jefferson, Brian Edwards, Devin Duvernay. That class was really good. So, I mean, that one's got to be in the conversation. I think that's, at this point, you're probably still saying that one's better. And then 2021, Jamar Chase... That did have Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddle, Devonta Smith, Kadarius Toney, Rashad Bateman, Elijah Moore, Rondale Moore. So that one fell off a little bit quicker, but that top talent is insane. But yeah, these wide receiver classes just keep getting better and better. It feels like uh, the from a depth perspective, it is feeling like um, is it's up there. I don't know if I would go better though than. Uh, than that 2020 class. All right, from Matthew, with Jimmy G out, is the NFC now officially a two-team race? No offense to the Vikings, but I feel like they've shown to be a cut below Philly and Dallas. They are a cut below, but anything can happen in the playoffs. It really can. I think the Vikings can beat those teams, even though they've gotten spanked by them the last couple times. Um... 
you know, football games are weird. Things get out of hand. I think both the Eagles and, and Cowboys games got out of hand early for the Vikings. But, you know, the Vikings also beat the Bills. Like, they're a legit team. They they wouldn't be favored in those games, but I wouldn't say it's a two-team race. No. And I'm not I'm not counting the Niners out either. They can they can muddy things up and still find ways to win with all of those playmakers, the play calling, the run game, the defense. They still have a lot of elite things going for them. If Brock Purdy can play, and I think he can, just be a you know, the 34th best quarterback in the NFL. And, you know, they just need a point guard. And Brock Purdy was exactly that coming out. So, no, I, I wouldn't say it's a two-team race, but you do have two clear favorites for, for sure. From Skyler, uh, being a Saints fan living in Atlanta is painful enough, but imploding to Tom Brady on Monday night is as worse as it gets. <laughs> that does sound pretty bad. Which which twin team between the Falcons and Saints do you believe is in greater purgatory hell? I think the Saints are in more hell. You know, Saints don't have much of a path forward. The Falcons still kind of do. It's just the quarterback question is so weird there, but the Falcons are at least, they have cap space, they have draft picks. Like, I wouldn't say they're in hell. They're just kind of in neutral. Whereas the Saints, it's like, I genuinely don't know where you go. I really don't. Like, I really think the Saints need to blow it up and hit rock bottom more than anybody. Uh, From Jade, I think I speak for all Chargers fans when I say Joe Lombardi is not it. Considering that the Chargers probably won't fire Staley, what OC and scheme would you like to see Staley bring in next season? Also, do you think Herbert can bounce back from his regression next season? Yes, I think Herbert can bounce back, 100%. And what about Joe Brady? Spent a year in Buffalo, learned that system, learned the Brian Dable system, either him or... um, or is no Mike Kafka is the see the Giants OC yeah what about Mike Kafka that'd be fun he's 35 years old spent a year under under the under day ball I think he can be hired because he's not the play caller so I want someone from the Brian Dable system deep developing crossing routes plenty of play action boots can get a little bit creative with them in the run game. Really good at designing protections. I would go either Kafka or Joe Brady. And that's it. That's all we got. Uh, what a show. I hope you guys enjoyed. I think you guys will like that one. Um, ended up being about as long as the game recaps anyway. But uh, really fun one. Thank you for listening. This has been the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. If you could leave a review, if you've got a second here just as a Christmas gift to me, if you're listening to the audio version, uh, if you're on YouTube, hit that like button. Uh, check out that Underdog Fantasy promo code TFG. And we're out of here. Thanks for watching. Peace out.